Hey, what's good, self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great, and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital, and today we're coming at you with a special Friday episode to recap Tilray earnings and some other news that we've seen from this week in cannabis. So before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos, and there's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place, so that you can watch episodes to learn about the evolution of the industry over time, identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up and take advantage whenever you're ready. But on Wednesday, Tilray released their earnings and this was the first time releasing earnings after merging with the two companies of Free and Tilray to create this new entity. So we're gonna go through it. And the main takeaway from the conference call was that Erwin Simon does wanna do some shopping and plans to buy a US MSO. So what we saw on Wednesday though was great. Uh, the stock went up 25% because we weren't really expecting much. So when you're not expecting a whole lot of good to come out of an earnings report, and when it does and you get pleasantly surprised, you got to take those small victories because otherwise it could have just been disappointing and we could see more red. But main thing to take away is the company did not provide guidance but spoke positively about the long-term plans and short-term tailwinds. It set a 2024 estimate revenue vision of $4 billion, almost six times current pro forma run rate as per our math. And the $4 billion vision includes organic growth as well as M&A, uh, where they plan to enter a U.S. cannabis market via potential option-based deals with MSOs to be consummated once legalization arrives. So something similar to what can P has already in line with acreage and Terrasen likely. So this comes from Cantor Fitzgerald, which was good to see, again, based on what the day ended up being, uh, green as opposed to red, and then going forward, well, what can we expect from here on out? And what does this tell us about Tilray being optimistic that legalization might come sooner than later? Full scale federal legalization in the US. But regardless, we're going to go through these earnings and just keep in mind, I'm not a financial advisor and I'm not trained in finance or anything like that. I'm just an early investor in Afria and was fortunate enough to make a good chunk of my money doing that. So obviously I've been with this company for a while and I do believe in them long term. So again, I'm not a financial advisor. This is not advice. I just want to try and provide context and show you what I think is good, what I think is bad, and then compare LPs to LPs and then USMSOs to USMSOs. So you can get an idea of what might be overvalued, what might be undervalued, and where's the best place to park your money going forward. So Tilray reported their 2021 fiscal year and fourth quarter results. And obviously bringing this company together does make them one of the biggest players in Canada officially, especially because they have that large global footprint to compete with Canopy. But we can see their net revenue increased 27% to 513 million compared to the year prior. Net income of positive 33.6 million, adjusted EBITDA of 12.3 million, net cash from operating activities of 8.3 million, and positive cash flow of 3.3 million in Q4. So this is all for Q4, which is good to show that in this quarter, a lot of their metrics were positive. And I think that's what people weren't necessarily expecting. So that is very good. But then when we look at the full year, we can see that the numbers aren't as nice. But obviously, points them going into a better direction that they're improving. Completed business combination with Afria achieved $35 million in synergies to date on track for 80 million target. And I believe this is USD. Um, so that's good to see. Cannabis revenue grew 55% in Q4, number one market share in Canada, leading EU GMP certified medical cannabis LP in Europe with demand growing, and their executive leadership ex executing on plan to drive accelerated growth and sustained profitability in the global cannabis market. So we're going to go through some of their financial highlights, and then we're going to go through their business development highlights, and then we're going to look through the, the breakdown of their um, balance sheet, comprehensive income statement, and cash flow statement. So net revenue increased 25% to $142 million during the fourth quarter from $113.5 million in the prior year quarter. The increase was driven by 36% growth in net cannabis revenue to $53.7 million, which included four weeks of contribution from Legacy Tilray. So from my understanding, this means that only four weeks of Tilray sales have actually been added. And so most of these numbers actually do still come from Afria alone. A 10% decline, or what was from the entity Afria, a 10% decline in distribution revenue, net beverage alcohol revenue of $15.9 million following our suit water acquisition on November 25th. 2020 and wellness revenue of 5.8 million from Manitoba Harvest. Net income of 33.6 million during the fourth quarter compared to a net loss of 83.4 million in the prior year quarter. So they are cleaning up <laughs> the amount of money that they're losing uh, from last year quite a bit. And I imagine going forward, that's going to make a big difference as they save on a lot of costs, as opposed to spending and losing a lot like other LPs such as Canopy and Aurora. But adjusted EBITDA increased 285% to 12.3 million during the fourth quarter. Again, not the whole year, just the fourth quarter from 3.2 million in the prior year quarter, making the ninth consecutive quarter of positive adjusted EBITDA. Gross profit decreased 19% from 22.5 million during the fourth quarter from 27.8 million in the prior year quarter. Included in gross profit was a one-time inventory valuation adjustment of 19.9 million resulting from excess inventory quantities 
uh, pawn the business combination with Afria, and that seems to touch on the issue that Canada was having, so much cannabis that they grew and not enough ability to sell it. Adjusted gross profit, excluding inventory valuation adjustments, increased 53% to $42.4 million during the fourth quarter from $27.8 million in the prior year quarter. Free cash flow increased 112% to $3.3 million, positive at least, which is nice to see in the fourth quarter from negative $28.3 million in the prior year quarter. And so financial highlights for the whole year, net revenue increased 27% to $513 million during 2021 from $405.3 million in 2020. So that is an increase. And again, that's mostly what Afria did last year. So it's good to see that at least coming organically from them. And I imagine once they get more of Tillery's numbers into the next earnings, it's just going to make these numbers stronger. The increase was driven by 55% growth in net cannabis revenue to 201.4 million, which included four weeks of contribution from Legacy Tillery, 1% growth in distribution revenue to 277.3 million. So at least, although we saw a 10% decrease in the distribution revenue in the fourth quarter, 1% growth in the whole year uh, is nice to see. Hopefully they can improve that over time with net beverage alcohol revenue of 28.6 million following our Sweetwater acquisition November 25th and the wellness revenue for Manitoba Harvest. Now, well, for the full year, they had a net loss of 336 million in 2021 compared to a net loss of 100.8 million in 2020, which was driven by 63.6 million of transaction costs related to out-of-pocket fees to consummate our business combinations and 170.5 million of non-cash unrealized loss on our convertible dentures. Now, I'm not exactly sure how this applies to the net loss, but I just know that convertible dentures are a form of debt and typically if they're convertible, you can con you can convert them from debt into equity for common shares. So I'm not sure if that was from people converting debt into equity or not, but what's interesting is that the 63.6 million of transaction costs comes after the combination of these two companies to create a new entity would save 80 million in cost energy. So obviously cost money to make money and to merge, but just funny that as much as they want to save that money, they're spending it in the first place. Mind you, their adjusted EBITDA increased 598% to $40.8 million in 2021 from $5.8 million in 2020. And I imagine a large portion of this is from Afria's numbers being added to Tilray because Afria was the healthiest uh, company in terms of balance sheet before the merger, with gross profit increasing 28% to $123.2 million during 2021 from $96.1 million in the prior quarter. Including in gross profit was a one-time inventory valuation adjustment of $119 million in Q4 resulting from that excess inventory, and adjusted gross profit excluding inventory valuation adjustment increased 50% to $143.9 million in 2021 from $96.1 million in 2020. And they ended the year with a strong balance sheet and liquidity, including cash and cash of 488.5 million. So that is something that's nice for them to have a war chest of almost 500 million US dollars. No doubt they're very happy to have that so they can go shopping in the future, but it's just good to see how combining these two companies did actually just make for a stronger competitor that would be able to go against canopy growth. And as someone who was an existing shareholder beforehand, that just makes me you know, happy as a, as a continued Tilray shareholder. Now, recent business developments reflect strong ongoing global growth and opportunity. And again, if you're looking at Canadian LPs, you want to be considering the global growth in the future because US MSOs, not many of them are expanding outside of the US, not many have global reach. That's what the Canadian LPs offer that US MSOs don't. So, so to highlight, they have seen recent progress on expanding their international medical business and their Canadian adult use product line. As Tilray has been gaining market share nationally in Canada month over month since April, 2021. On July 19, 2021, our wholly owned subsidiary Sweetwater Brewing Company, the 11th largest craft brewer in the U.S., announced the launch of 420 Imperial IPA, first line extension of its flagship 420 brand, so they are selling at least beer in the U.S. In July 20 or July 12, 2021, Sweetwater Brewing announced its West Coast expansion, including a new Colorado brewery and its opening of Sweetwater Mountain Tap House at the Denver Airport. On July 7, 2021, we announced the completion and shipment of our first successful EU GMP certified medical cannabis harvest grown in Germany for German distribution, so that was, that's been a long time coming, but that's Good to hear. On June 30th, 2021, we announced the first cross-brand product collaboration between Canadian craft cannabis brand Broken Coast and Sweetwater to launch U.S. distribution of Broken Coast BC Lager and introduce the cannabis brand to consumers across the country. If you're Canadian and you don't know that name, you should because Broken Coast is the creme de la crop of premium cannabis that we have available here. So if you haven't tried it, you must. On June 25th, 2021, our leading cannabis, uh, Canadian cannabis brand Riff launched new multi-packs of cannabis pre-rolls across Canada. While on June 8th, 2021, we launched new medical cannabis brand Symbios across Canada, which is the inaugural brand for the new Tilray, developed to offer patients a broader spectrum of medical cannabis formats and cannabinoid ratios at a better price point. While lastly, on April 27, 2021, Tilray was named a Times inaugural list of Times 100 most influential companies in the world. No doubt a spot they paid good money for, but 
any press is good press in the cannabis space. So that's really it for the company highlights. Now, if we look at the numbers, we can see that on their balance sheet, they have more cash than they did last year. So clearly coming together does give them more cash on hand to spend. Accounts receivable, it seems like they have about 87 million that they are still yet to be paid from their uh, clients or whoever they work with while their inventory is sitting fairly high now, of course, that they've combined as well, 256 million worth of cannabis sitting in there. Um, but regardless, their total current assets, 883 million, a decent amount of capital right now. And then if we look at their current liabilities, 400 million. So at least what we can see is that their current liability or their current assets can cover their current liabilities. So for the next 12 months, they should be fine and not have to raise any more debt. Although one thing that they are planning to do is dilute shareholders and increase the amount of outstanding shares, which I'm not a fan of, and I actually have not voted for that yet at all. Uh, but they did delay the vote until August because I imagine a lot of shareholders don't want to allow that either. But one thing to add, uh, outside of their current assets, they do have intangible assets of 1.6 billion and then goodwill of 2.8 billion. So that's roughly... 3.4 billion of stuff that needs to be written off in the future because intangible assets and goodwill are things that are added when you purchase or when synergies come together they don't actually have any value so as we can see that massively increased uh, because of this but still if you subtract 3.4 billion from here you've got about 3.6 billion in assets it still does cover their total liabilities of 1.5 billion so in the long run they will be able to keep themselves afloat but the main question is if they do want to buy an mso in the future where is that cash coming from and how much more cash are they going to need to raise in order to do that so that's the main question to ask but regardless uh it's nice to see that they have a lot of cash on hand. Now, these are the main things that we wanted to look at. So if we look here, this is just for the three months ended. So this is for Q4, this is for the entire year. And so net revenue, this most recent quarter, 142.2 million, up from 113 million. Cost of goods sold also increased, which is not ideal though, 85 million up to 119. But again, this is the first earnings after the merger. So there's a lot of mess just to be cleaned up. And their gross profit decreased from last year, 27.8 million to 22.4 million. Um, increased general and administrative costs as well. So a lot of things did go up, but I think the main thing for them that they want to highlight is that after all was said and done for Q4, they did manage a positive net income of 33.6 million and a positive earnings per share of 18 cents. Now, if we look at the full year, that is not the case. They were not nearly as profitable and they did lose some money compared to last year, but we're going to go through that into a bit more detail and compare that to canopy growth here. So if we look um, last year, they did 405 million this year, 513 million with cost of goods going up 309 million to 389 million with, but they did increase their gross profit year over year, which obviously is good to see. Now this is where it's tricky though, because Canadian LPs are typically good at losing money because our market situation is a bit of a mess. Now, if we look at the whole year, they obviously did increase their sales and their gross profit, which is nice to see that after all of this mess, they did still manage to grow the numbers that are important. But if we look here, we can see an operating loss of 132 million up from 104 million, and then a total net income loss of 336 million up from 100.8 million. Now, typically in the past, Afria and Tilray were both losing less money than some of the bigger players like Aurora and Canopy, but I just wanted to compare you know, this is the worst of the worst that we've seen out of Afria or Tilray. But if we compare this to the last year of Canopy, where they brought in 546 million, and then cost of revenue, though, was 479 million. So they only made a profit of 66.9 million compared to, let's say, a profit of 123. So again, Tilray is ahead of them just in their ability to actually make a profit from their operations. And then if we go to our operating expenses, 653 million compared to uh, 255 million of total operating expenses, and then operating income, negative 586 million, compared to 2020, negative 1 billion. So this is where, again, if you're trying to compare LPs, which is important, if you were want to invest in one Canadian LP, you have to look at other Canadian LPs just to weigh the, di the differences, but that is where we can see um, still just a massive advantage likely getting into till right now as opposed to getting into canopy as they've lost this amount in the past now again past performance is not indicative of future results it's possible canopy can clean that up but i just hope that this is good information for anyone that's looking to learn about investing and considering you know in one company you want to weigh the pros and cons of that one company compared to some other companies in the same industry in the same country uh, you know in the same sort of category that way you're going to get a better understanding of the company now last few things i wanted to go through and then we got the revenue breakdown which i think is the most important because it does go a long way in showing us how tilray is a little bit more diversified than some of the other lps in different ways um, but definitely just tells us too how much cannabis they're selling so their cannabis revenue 53.7 million 
not a whole lot. Uh, it did increase 38% from last year, 39.5 million though. So it is good to see this number go up. But at the same time, when you compare cannabis revenue to let's say US MSOs that deal with cannabis alone and not distribution or beverage, MSOs are way ahead in making dollar amounts. And then distribution revenue, 66.7, uh, which is 47% of their revenue. So it's like, hey, you know, Tilray is a cannabis producing company, but most of their revenue does come from distribution in Germany. And that's from the distribution company they own. But as we can see, the numbers decreased, decreased 66.7 million down from 73.95. Uh, a year ago. So that's obviously something to consider. Obviously, that's a big portion of their revenue. And if they're losing revenue from that section of their revenue, it's not ideal. Um, so it's good to see that they did buy Sweetwater because this obviously added 11%, 15.9 million to their revenue. And then wellness revenue, this is from Manitoba Harvest, 5.7 million. So if you look at this in total, though, only 38% comes from cannabis, um, as opposed to the total 100. Now, not to say that's a bad thing, and in, in a way, it makes Tilray further diversified and a unique company in that sense as they expand globally and try to build on that medical cannabis play. Um, but if we look at the whole year-over-year -year cannabis revenue, $201 million, up from $129 million. So it did increase year-over-year, -year, though, as obviously they are selling more as Ontario opens more stores and we increase uh, legal access points to steal from the black market share. Uh, but their distribution revenue did, again, year-over-year over -year increase from $277 million, uh, up from 275 million. So again, that's a tiny percentage increase, but still, uh, at least they're not losing money year over year in that sense. But ideally, you want to be increase, increasing your distribution revenue. And then for the first time, though, this beverage alcohol revenue from Sweetwater, we didn't have this on any previous uh, reports. So this one is their 28.5 million, 6% of it, with wellness revenue 5.7 million, 1%. So again, for a cannabis company, only 38% of revenue is coming from cannabis, right? So it's very worth noting and that's why it's worth getting into the nitty-gritty of this now uh with ebitda and all these other numbers i'm not going to get too much into the technicals because even for myself i just like to focus on things that i can understand knowing that a company you know has a good footprint their brands do well they have a good market share and that where they're expanding is likely going to open up and and give them the ability for example tilray in germany um to accelerate their sales growth but if we just look at the quarter though net income again for this quarter was positive compared to previous so it just seems to highlight that Tilray is on track to become more profitable as they head forward uh, because this merger, the whole idea I think was to clean up their balance sheet. But the last thing I did want to show you with their margins, because if we go down here, we can see their key operating metrics. At least they're trying to keep their cannabis margins as high as the US MSOs, which are closer to 50%, which is very impressive. Cannabis gross margin, excluding adjustments, 44.5% for this last quarter, 45% for the year. Beverage gross margin, 66.5%, 58.6%. Uh, distribution gross margin, see just 9.5%. 12.6%. Uh, so not ideal. Their biggest revenue generator has the least amount of margin. So that's not ideal. And obviously, if they want to make more profits, they're going to have to optimize that so that they spend less and end up keeping more with their wellness gross margin at 69%. But then if we look at their, um, we're going to go down to this one first, their gross margin for the last three months on cannabis. What the heck? Oh, sorry. On cannabis, just 7%. Which is not ideal. Beverage, 66%. Distribution, 10%. 27% from wellness. So this they're gonna really need to pick this up, increase their gross margins from cannabis and from distribution. As we can see from the recent quarter, they're known as a cannabis company, yet only 7% of their gross profit is made up of cannabis, while their largest source of revenue, their distribution revenue from CC Pharma in Germany, makes up only 10%. So their work is cut out for them. They know what they have to work on. So after the merger, the mess will, or the work will be to clean this up. But as we can see, when we factor in the inventory value adjustment and the adjusted gross profit, apparently their gross margins go from 7% to 44% if we take these away. So that's something positive to highlight at least and then free cash flow again for the quarter first time ever which is positive 8.2 million um afterwards free cash flow 3.3 million so just still an improvement because if we factor in all of last year they went from losing 199 million in free cash flow to 83 million and then from last quarter negative 28.2 to a positive 3.3 so small incremental steps to improvement for tilray but it's nice to see that um and again i want to bring you back to the u.s cannabis investor portal which highlights all of the canadian lps and the u.s mso's in one place now it's important to know if you want to invest in a canadian lp you can only compare the LP to other Canadian LPs, okay? And if you want to invest in US MSOs, you can only in compare US MSOs to other US MSOs. Comparing LPs to MSOs is useless and irrelevant because they look at two completely different markets and they can't sell to each other's markets at this point. So that is just something that obviously, if you've done that in the past, don't do that going forward. But just wanted to add here, diluted market cap. This is the most important thing to look at because Cureleaf, the largest cannabis company right now, is worth $8.3 billion. So if you wanted to buy them outright from Bojo, you'd need to fork over $8.3 billion. He would not sell that. He would want a premium of likely something
something 20, 25 million, something way, way ahead of that. But they're valued at 8.3 billion, the whole company, and they're bringing in, they brought in last quarter revenue of 260 million. And so if we go down this list, Canopy Growth, second company that loses a lot of money, is not financially healthy, they're valued at 7.4 billion. Last quarter, they brought in 123 million of revenue. Not ideal. So as we can see, you're getting a much better bang for your buck likely buying Curly for this price than Canopy at this price. Then if we go down Green Thumb, $6.7 billion their total valuation. So share is just that total valuation divided by the number of shares available to buy. That's how you get the share price, right? But for $6.7 billion, they brought in $194 million in revenue last quarter. And this is, again, all from cannabis, not from other diversified revenue streams. This is all from cannabis alone. So if we can see here Tilray, $6.8 billion, they brought in just $57 million from cannabis. And yes, this is looking at the cannabis revenue alone. So Canopy did bring in more from cannabis. Now, I believe they also include some other like CBD stuff. So I don't necessarily think this is clearly broken down um, fairly because in here it's accounting for sales that is not just cannabis uh, from Canopy. But here down here, Tilray, they only have Tilray sales um, as opposed to Tilray's total, which includes all of their different revenue sources. Regardless, I uh, just wanted to go down this and keep continue truly $4.5 billion to get $194 million in sales versus Tilray, $6.8 billion to get just 57 million in cannabis sales. Or for example, Verano right now valued at $4.4 billion, bringing in revenue of $143 million from cannabis sales alone per quarter. Or, you know, my largest holding, Cresco Labs, valued at $4.1 billion, but bringing in $178 million last quarter from cannabis sales. So again, if you're, would you want to buy a company that's valued at $6.8 billion? but only bringing in 57 from cannabis sales or a company that's worth 4.1 billion, but bringing in 178 from cannabis sales alone. Obviously, the lower the market cap that you're investing in, the more potential upside. And if the market cap is low, but the company's bringing in more revenue than a company with a higher market cap bringing in less revenue, that is where more potential upside is. Hence, the price is more likely to go up than it is to go down versus buying Canadian LP when it's expensive, the price is more likely to go down from there than it is to go up just based on the underlying sales and fundamentals. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing for you. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions. I tried my best on the fly, but um, that explains it. So if you go down the list, you will have to search up whether any of these are Canadian LPs, but I can tell you like Canopy Growth, um, Tilray, Kronos, Aurora Cannabis, uh, Sundial, these are Canadian LPs, anything else is US MSO. Obviously, you can just Google whether what's an LP and an MSO, but it's good to know. And obviously, the more you do this, uh, it sticks in your memory and it just becomes second nature. But just wanted to show this because this was, as of Wednesday, daily traded volume so far in the US. Tilray had traded 1.6 billion shares. Now, keep in mind, Tilray is a Canadian LP and in Canada, cannabis is federally legal. So they are allowed to list on the US major stock exchanges like the NASDAQ. And that's why they can have 1.6 billion shares traded within a single trading day. If we look at Canopy, one, or 103 million shares traded in a single trading day as well, but then look at MSOS. Even though it trades on the New York Stock Exchange because it's in cannabis, and again, cannabis in the US is still federally illegal, therefore banks or investment firms can't invest without fear of federal prosecution until some sort of safe, ha safe harbor language comes, and that's what we're waiting on Safe Banking Act to provide. MSOS only traded 13.9 million shares. Trulieve only traded 1.2 million shares. Cureleaf only traded 6.6 .6 million shares. And correction for Trulieve, sorry, it's 12 million oops, not 1.2 million. But still, you might be asking, why can Tilray and Canopy Growth see so many shares traded when their market cap's relatively expensive compared to the amount of cannabis revenue they're seeing quarter over quarter? But then these US multi-state operators, they're seeing many less shares traded, yet their valuations are much lower relative to the amount of cannabis revenue they're bringing in every single quarter. And again, folks, that is just because Tilray and CGC being Canadian LPs can list on major U.S. exchanges like the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange where these U.S. MSOs can't until cannabis is federally legalized or there's some safe harbor language in a piece of legislation that says banks and investment firms can invest without fear of federal prosecution. That is what we are waiting for. That is what, if you invest now, you're getting in before the U.S. firms and banks are able to get in. And you know that they want to get in, they just can't until the government does something about it. Now, on that note, it's interesting to note that yesterday, House approves cannabis banking, employment, and D.C. sales provisions in large-scale spending bill. And so this was huge news to see. I do not know if this provides the safe harbor language, but regardless, this is good to hear. So I wanted to cover it. The U.S. House of Representatives on Thursday approved a package of spending legislation that contains measures to provide protections for banks that work with state legal cannabis businesses and allow the legalization of cannabis sales in Washington 
Washington, D.C., among many other policy provisions. And apparently, they're looking forward to votes on even more far-reaching cannabis amendments that are up for consideration on separate spending bills, such as those covering the Department of Justice that are expected to be considered soon. But this is a win in two ways. The first one, the legislation restricts the use of certain funds to punish banks for working with cannabis businesses. Previously, it was medical cannabis businesses, so this change to just cannabis businesses alone is great, and I don't know if this could be that safe harbor language. So if you let, if you know any more, let me know in the comments, but this is fresh news. Hopefully we'll get more information over the weekend and I can relay that on Sunday, but it's nice to see that this moves from medical cannabis to cannabis businesses in general, saying none of the funds made available in this act may be used to penalize a financial institution solely because the institution provides financial services to the entity that is in the cannabis industry. So I don't know about you, but that looks like safe harbor language. We're going to have to wait to find out, and obviously this is just in the House. It will have to move into the Senate, but this is nice to see, uh, and the provision which only covers restrictions on the Treasury Department is far less reaching than other more robust House bills that have been passed on four occasions, and it would still provide some protections to financial institutions that work with state legal cannabis operators. Well, the other one comes from D.C. When it comes to D.C. cannabis policy, local voters legalized personal possession and cultivation in 2014. What? Get that. But a congressional rider has prevented the local government from using its tax dollars to regulate retail sales. That would change if the House passed bill, which does not contain the provision, is enacted, despite the fact that a budget proposal from President Joe Biden seeks to maintain the provision on denying DC autonomy to legalize cannabis commerce. So that's great to see because Congress is defying Biden's wishes and making sure that DC can go on the promise that the citizens were granted in 2014 that they should be able to have a regulated adult use system. So this is big for cannabis. I will update this on uh, Sunday if we get any more developments. And as much as Booker wants to play bad cop and look tough, it's shooting himself in the foot if he's refusing to acknowledge the fact that Safe Banking Act isn't just about rewarding big companies, it's about protecting hardworking American citizens and providing small businesses with functional banking because this is something that's going on every day that the U.S. federal government refuses to act and drags its feet. Four armed men robbed Canada, West Seattle, holding employments, holding employees at gunpoint before stealing 14,000 in cannabis and 2,500 in cash. No arrests happened on July 19th. Detectives are looking for more info. Now, the good thing is no one died here, but there have been a lot of murders because of armed robberies, because cannabis has to work in cash, because banks can't work with them, and it's just ridiculous. So it's about time that this gets changed, and that's why I believe that they will. But regardless, just wanted to relay all that for you in this one Friday Jam Pack episode. So I hope you got some value out of it, folks. Um, that is it for today's episode. So I want to thank you so much for tuning in. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or concerns about Tilray or about safe banking or any of the information that I've relayed. Uh, besides that, though, if you enjoyed this video or you learned something, please leave a like on it. Subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos, and I will catch you on Sunday for this week in cannabis news. Have a great Friday and great weekend, everybody.